Welcome to the Sports Performance Professional Podcast, where we bring you and discuss the realities of the sports performance industry. I want to show you how to sign up for our emailing list. And all you go to is Athletic Holistic Systems. That's holistic with an H. I have it on the screen right now. Dot com. That's Athletic Holistic Systems. Dot com. And you go up to the right hand corner. You click that podcast tab. It'll take you to the Sports Performance Professional Podcast page. You scroll all the way down and you type in your first name, last name, and your email, and you'll get sent back a confirmation that you have successfully signed up for the podcast. And what we do here on this podcast, I pick a particular topic, a research article, social media content, a blog post, whatever the piece of content may be, I take that piece for my topic and I talk about it section by section, line by line, and I give you what the facts are, historical context, and I relate that back to why does it matter now? And these articles can be uh, throughout uh, history, so they could be as early as a decade ago. It may be all over the place. But today, this is a pop-up podcast because yesterday I was going over and looking at an article by Dan Witzel, who I'll be talking about today, if I'm saying his last name correctly. And I said, man, you know, this research for the anticipated third podcast regards to Major League Baseball and Minor League Baseball 2021, I decided to just, in the moment, you know how I do, to just hop on and discuss this amateurism in the NCAA. And for strength coaches, how does this affect us? Going all the way back to that first podcast, talking about should strength coaches unionize. So today, let me actually pull it up on the screen for you. Today's pop-up podcast, number three, is entitled Dan Wetzel Archives, Playing Hot Potato, Hot Potato, at that with the grenade, who blows up? The strength coaches or the compliance office? Hey, I, I kind of get crazy and creative with these, these, these titles, but I'm explaining exactly what we're gonna discuss today and the implications for strength coaches who want more respect, who want to not be marginalized, who want to be compensated for their value. Uh, this matters because the compliance office may be one of the issues, if not the issues, why strength coaches are not, if you believe you're not getting it based on, again, some objective things I discussed in the first podcast, accounting for education, accounting for uh, consecutive years working in the field, accounting for being at the same job, uh, if you're talking about getting compensated at the same university or the same company, et cetera, uh, and then the type of skills, knowledge, and abilities you're coming to um, the job with, especially when skill obsolescence can actually make something that you do programming-wise, assessment-wise, may actually be out of date, especially with technology moving at a progressively fast rate. So, Let's talk a little bit about Dan. Let me exit out of this, get you pulled up. And I won't go too, too deep into Dan's background. Let me this up. So it's just a quick wiki search. Search, say that right? Oh, snap, I gotta be more careful. <laughs> so basically Dan Wetzel, as a sports writer, he has worked as the national columnist for Yahoo Sports and Yahoo.com covering events around the world, including the NFL, college football, the NBA, NASCAR, Major League Baseball, NHL, mixed martial arts, men's and women's World Cups, and the Olympics. His columns appear in the sports section of yahoo.com. So Dan Witzel is an award-winning sports writer, so he's no joke, and he's been writing on this topic of amateurism in the in, – uh, college sports for years, for years. So 
let's get into, and let me create some context of why this may be important. So my first article we'll look at is entitled Smaller Universities Struggle to Fulfill NCAA's Many Rules. And this was published in March of 2019 because I want to just pull up some stuff that's relevant. And this one was actually interesting. So let me quote. Like most warning shots, it was a loud and flashy design to capture attention. Like most warning shots, it drew no blood. And like many warning shots, it isn't likely to force much, uh, much change. In early February, the NCAA used Siganaw Valley State University. Shout out to anybody at Siganaw Valley. I don't know anybody there, but shout out because I got you on the podcast to launch its latest warning to member institutions. This time, the smaller schools that make up Division II. Springboarding off a self-report with Siganaw Valley on paperwork issues that led to 130 athletes and 15 sports competing improperly over several years. The NCAA warned schools that they must have a strong compliance program, a tall task for smaller schools. So let me actually zoom this in for you so you can see that a little better on screen. Now, let me repeat. The NCAA warned schools that they must have a strong compliance program a tall task for smaller schools. Now, this is the first issue with having a central body like the NCAA forcing these rules onto smaller schools and schools in general, because in this case, compliance only works for those who have the resources to institute it and put money into it. For other schools, you're actually incentivizing them to go against the rules because they cannot simply afford to have a full-time compliance staff along with all the other amenities and resources they have to allocate to sports. So if you look at it objectively, you are actually incentivizing people to cut the rules. I talked about this in the first podcast. Doesn't matter what you think about it. You have to look at the facts. You have to look at it objectively, look at it from both sides. Regulations, policies, laws, whatever you want to call it, they have a positive trade-off, but you also have to go back to that negative trade-off. What is the negative trade-off? Let's move forward. Quote, the committee is cognizant of the financial challenges faced by many Division II member schools. The NCAA said it's in its new release announcing its decision. However, this case illustrates the need for all Division II schools to ensure that they devote the necessary funds and staffing, funds and staffing, to establish an effective and reliable compliance program that at a minimum can fulfill basic and fundamental responsibilities of membership, including eligibility certification, as exemplified in this case. Despite the stern words and the finding of lack of institutional control at Siganaw State, excuse me, normally the harshest of rulings the NCAA can make the punishment was largely a slap on the wrist. Siganaw Valley is forfeiting wins, going on probation for four years and paying a $5,000 fine. So this is interesting because break the rules over 130 and you get a, you break, you do it again. I'm gonna get you next time. The slap on the wrist. I'm not saying that it should be enforced, but the point being is if a rule is broken, everybody has to be held to an accountable punishment. If, if you're going to execute and enforce these rules collectively, nationally, it can't be subjective. So that's the other issue we have with let's say the NCAA or a collective body, enforcing the rules effectively and fairly that have the same outcomes. If someone breaks this rule, this is the same outcome. If someone breaks this rule, this is the same outcome. Cannot be subjective. Let's move forward. It's unlikely the NCAA's warning shot will have much impact across the hundreds of universities that make up division two. Many of these schools are struggling with decreasing enrollment 
and C, adding more sport teams as a way to grow enrollment. And I definitely understand this at the NAI level, and I was also at the Division II level. This is absolutely the reality. Sports teams and having more athletes drives up enrollment, for sure. Let me continue. The same schools also often run their athletic departments at a loss financially, meaning they often don't have big administrative staffs. Now, that is another reality. We saw this as soon as COVID hit. Olympic sports were on the chopping block. Let me continue. That meant the compliance staffer could spend six minutes on each athlete during a normal work week. So this next section is called a lack or entitled a lack of resources. And this is actually where I'll end um, because then I'll, I've already established my point. Uh, and kind of the context I wanted to provide it on what the NCAA, the woes of the NCAA, and then secondly, how compliance being forced to have uh, compliance to enforce rules that shouldn't exist, that are outdated. Dan Wetzel will provide that background. It's outdated. This is forcing schools to do things that they know not otherwise in a free market, free market system, would have to do. And I'll get into it later on, separating or separating or separation of education and athletics. You can't serve two masters. You can't serve two bosses. So they need to be separated. As you see from this previous comment, they're using athletic teams as a way to spark or boost enrollment. That's not what athletics are for. Let's not kid ourselves. And everyone knows that the more you focus on sports, it's a full-time job in college athletics, the less, the less probability you're going to spend on your studies. But how much money and resources and time are allocated to providing these student athletes with exceptional educational aid, learning specialists, tutors, mandatory homework hours, et cetera, that don't go to normal students. So we have to look at that as well. How much resources are being allocated to things that should just not be a part of the puzzle? Let me continue to read. In early September, 2017, the then compliance director of Siganaw Valley discovered problems with the way the university certified its athletes as eligible. The university reported the problems to the NCAA, which launched an, inve- an investigation. And I got to I got to watch out. Getting rough out here trying to pronounce words. Among the problems found from 2013 to 2014 through 2016 through 2017, 69 athletes practiced and competed before being certified. And 13 were certified as early academic qualifiers before their high school transcripts were sent to the NCAA Eligibility Center. From 2013 to 2014 through 2017, 2018, 14 four-year college transfers competed during their first year of enrollment without setting out one full academic year as required by NCAA bylaws. You, you, this is, I mean, that's ridiculous. Anyway, I, I know the rule, but that's ridiculous because it's tied to academics. It shouldn't be tied to academics, but let's continue. Hold on, I lost where I was. As requiring by NCAA bylaws, in 2016, 2017, four two-year college transfers participated and received athletics aid in their first year of enrollment without meeting the eligibility requirements of graduating from a two-year college or receiving a waiver to avoid the rule. And that same time period, I won't, I won't continue to repeat from 2013 to 2014 through 2016, 2017, 16 two-year college transfers participated and received athletics aid without meeting academic eligibility requirements. In addition, 18 athletes enrolling as freshmen were allowed to participate and receive athletics aid without meeting academic requirements. Do we see a, do we see a recurring problem here, a problem that does not have to exist? 
In 2016, 2017, two transfer athletes in football and men's soccer participated and received athletics aid without earning the requisite nine semester hours of transferable degree credit to certify their eligibility. And again, it's the stuff I'm going to cover. I cover this stuff in my research uh, and I actually didn't go over my background at the beginning of this one, but I'll do that on the back end. Actually, I'll do it right now really quick. And so I'm a PhD student at Middle Tennessee State University and I'm getting my specialization in sport pedagogy and I'm studying and creating a new infrastructure upon which we can identify coaches, develop coaches, and then send them out through workplace, a work placement program that I am creating and also trying to figure out this new free market infrastructure for youth all the way up to college athletics. It's crazy. But I think it's very doable and a change needs to be made. But let me continue with the article. Didn't want to go off too much on that. Need to remember to do it at the beginning. Now, quickly, compliance officer turnover is the next title of the next section. One primary reason for the breakdown of the certification process was the present or persistent, persistent turnover in the compliance administrator position, the NCAA found. During the four-year period prior to the discovery of the violations in fall 2017, four different individuals filled the role of associate director of athletics for compliance. The constant churn in the compliance office greatly hindered the institution's ability to implement, maintain, and monitor its certification program. Further, due to this turnover, communication broke down between the compliance office and coaches, especially regarding the expectations of the coaches in the certification process. In addition to repeated turnover in compliance personnel, SVSU failed to hire enough staff members to fulfill compliance responsibilities and functions, including eligibility certification. Exacerbating this situation was the institution's assignment of additional responsibilities and duties to the compliance administrator. These additional duties detracted from the compliance administrator's ability to fulfill compliance responsibilities, most notably eligibility certification. Because of inadequate staffing, the compliance administrator simply lacked the time to properly certify student athletes. John Decker, Signal Valley's athletic director agreed with the causes of the problem. Of course you did. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. Quote, we didn't have the staff we asked. We, did, we didn't have the staff and we asked the compliance person to do too much. He told the free press, there are a lot of steps to making sure a student is certified correctly. When you miss a step, they aren't certified and then it piles up. It was more than just a paperwork error. It was bad communication, but it was not an intentional attempt to get around the rules. Oh yeah, everyone can say that in hindsight. When at the beginning of the article, it was admitted that we don't have enough resources to try to keep a large full-time compliance staff. So I'll give them the benefit of the doubt, but hey, don't tell anybody. Let's continue. Last paragraph. Saginaw Valley now has the equivalent of two full-time compliance officers. It also has established a new committee that includes representatives from the university's registrar office, housing office, and others to make sure all departments are communicating about the athletes and any issues they are having that might make them ineligible. So I want you to think about this as I end this article and we get to what we all came here for, Dan Wetzel, Archives. So I want you to think really quick about who does this benefit? Does the NCAA and their rules and regulations, does it benefit the very bottom, the athletes? No. Let's go to the next level. Does the NCAA and their rules and regulation and compliance, does it benefit the coaches? 
sport coach, sport nutritionist, sport psychologist, strength coach, assistant coaches, position coaches. Does it benefit the coaches? Of course not. They will be breaking rules. Now let's get, go up to the next level. Do these rules and regulations benefit any other department in administration? No, it doesn't. It's a headache. It's not essential. Does it benefit, and let's go to another sub-level, the compliance office, the compliance staff? Of course it does, because if you're trying to enforce this nationwide, that creates what? Guaranteed jobs. And I'm not too sure on what these compliance jobs pay, but I, I would put my dollar and I'll go check this later of what an athletic administrator or the head of compliance may bring in you know, a, a, a pretty good salary. But we do know it will benefit the compliance office. It may not benefit anyone else, but we know it will benefit the compliance office because those are jobs, it's good money, et cetera. And it also would obviously be a benefit to the NCAA. So I just want you to keep that in mind as we move forward. Now, moving on to the first article by Dan Wetzel, September 11, 2013. And again, by new standards, you know, this is, and this was published back in the Ice Age, 2013. And we remember what's happened in 2013. But I just wanted to bring context that a lot of rules are still being violated as early as 2019, and there was other stuff with Texas A&M, Florida in 2020, et cetera. Uh, so let's get started. It's entitled, Latest College Scandals Again Reveal Foley or Folly of NCAA Rules. Quote, actually make this a little bigger for you on screen. If you're watching on video, just going to make this a little bigger. All right, here we go. Quote, here is the early prediction on what will come, at least in terms of NCAA sanctions from the accompanying Yahoo Sports story detailing how Luther Davis went from starting Alabama defensive end to middleman possibly funneling money from agents and financial planners to a handful of top SEC athletes, including some in Tuscaloosa. Nothing, or at least not much. The NCAA won't be able to get enough people to talk. They won't be able to access the paper trail. It's possible they won't even muster much of an effort. There isn't a direct tie to the coaching staffs. The schools involved, Alabama, Mississippi State, and Tennessee, will solemnly or solemnly declare their concern, even though the latter two are already on probation for previous things that produced solemn concern. Maybe volunteers defensive lineman Maurice Couch the only still eligible participant gets hit a little, but that'll be it. And that's fine. The NCAA always looks foolish when it tries to retroactively strip championships, in this case, Alabama's. It looks even worse when it argues that something horrible occurred if a kid such as DJ Fluker, who grew up poor even before Hurricane Katrina, left him homeless and sleeping in a car with four others, actually accepted some of the money that just above or just about everyone was willing to throw at him because they've defined his worth as far greater than just tuition, room, and board. Let that sink in. When it comes to these kinds of stories, much of the focus is on the NCAA enforcement angle. Some just want to know what the penalties will be and how it will affect competitive balance. Some want retribution along fair is fair guidelines, the NCAA lit up their favorite program. So it's about the time the damn tide got its, you know what? I'm gonna skip that word. I don't even wanna, I don't even wanna get caught on camera saying this next word. Let's move forward. 
<laughs> Still, others just want to blame the media for supposedly doing the NCAA's investigative work or even propping up the rule book by laying out violations. Almost everyone is missing the forest for the trees. These stories from J Johnny Manziel and autographs to Sports Illustrated current series on Oklahoma State to North Carolina academics to Naveen Shapiro to Yukon Hoops, if I'm saying that, that other word, uh, the other person's name, right? Nevin or Naveen or Nevin to Yukon Hoops to Saruzi Sports to John Blake to Oregon football to whatever is coming next contribute to the pulling back of the curtains on how this massive enterprise truly operates. There's enough media selling the fairy tale. We don't need fewer investigations. This is major college athletics, not those public relations commercials during the games with cinematography, soaring music, and canned concepts propping up amateurism as anything more than a tax dodge. And this is the river of underground money that flows through major college football. It's everywhere, it's undeniable, it's uncontainable. And I can, again, I'm gonna link all this up to strength coaches since this is the Sports Performance Professional Podcast. I'm gonna link it up for all other departments that work with Olympic sports, football, basketball, et cetera. Let me continue. The more that truth is exposed, the better. Luther Davis must have seen it all firsthand as a Crimson Tide player. When he wasn't quite good enough to make the NFL, he got into the business of the business. He got into the business of the business. Using his connections and credibility with current players who might make the pros to attract a slew of parties looking to gain access to them. If they didn't use Davis, they'd use someone else, maybe a high school or AAU coach, maybe a friend from home, maybe a minister or a family member, maybe even a college assistant coach, trainer or workout guy. That's how it works everywhere. And it always will. Amateurism is a bankrupt concept. Let that sink in. Let me read it again. Amateurism is a bankrupt concept. It was invented by British aristocrats in the mid 1800s as a way to keep working class athletes from succeeding at their elitist pursuist. Or excuse me, succeeding at their elitist pursuits read that word wrong basically as long as guys who had to labor in factories six days a week were worn out from the work and lacked time to practice the rich guys who never dealt with such concerns would continue to be superior at sailing or dressage or cricket or whatever talking about those sports at those times. So basically, the people who didn't need the money declared it noble to play for no pay. Is that not interesting? So those people who do who did not need to play sports for money decided that it was okay for everybody to live under that same conclusion, that same belief. So do you see already a problem with making a rule that may have good intentions? In this case, again, and I would have to obviously validate, uh, and not necessarily validate, but go and check the history books for myself as well so that I can come to the same conclusion or maybe a different one. But in principality, we have to understand, is it constitutional? Is it moral to force somebody to do something that they would not otherwise at their own discretion come to? In this case, we don't wanna get 
we don't need to be paid for playing sports, so neither do you. Or were they using politics in order to get an upper hand, which is what we've seen throughout politics always. But that's a time and a place for another discussion. Let's continue. How nice of them. Their true reasoning, of course, was to assure the continuation of their favored status on an uneven playing field of competition. The, this detestable idea was later co-opted by the NCAA and the modern Olympic Games. The ancient Greek athletes were actually paid. The public was then repeatedly sold the idea of the innocence of amateurism and sold it well. This conveniently allowed the powerful administrators to control all the revenue produced. Amateurism is a sham in practice too, one that simply isn't being followed or respected, as story after story after story proves. So many of the athletes, players, and administrators don't believe in it. That's the value of the coverage. It's made denying the extent of the violations laughable. Enforcing amateurism became so impossible and ridiculous that even the International Olympic Committee, still in favor of kickbacks and bribes, mind you, gave up on it nearly three decades ago. The Olympics didn't collapse because Usain Bolt and Michael Phelps can appear in TV commercials. It actually got more popular. It did not, it'd be no different in the college game, excuse me. This out the way. Besides, it's not like college administrators, commissioners, athletic directors, coaches, and so on have any use for the spirit of amateurism. They long ago ditched any semblance of austerity that might come if you were truly operating just at just an extracurricular activity for true nonprofit sports enterprise. Instead, they drape themselves in huge salaries, private planes, comp cars or company cars at this, and country club course memberships. They snatch every last freebie at Nike retreats and lounge on Caribbean cruises funded by bold executives. They hold their meetings at palm lined luxury hotels. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's run this back. We gotta stop, stop the press, stop for a second. Now let's go back to those series of questions I asked. Who is this of benefit to? We've already went through our yeses and nos. And I did discuss the monetary benefit for the athletic administrators when I asked them, but I said, how do the rules benefit them if the goal is to maximize, let's say winning, popularity, because if you break the rules, you get punished, you know, punished, the slap on the wrist. But nonetheless, you get punished. So therefore breaking the rules should be an incentive to not, engage in foul play, but yet they do. So therefore, the rules don't play any benefit on that level. But if we're talking about, in this case, revenue, greenbacks, shillings, then money will make you do crazy stuff. Let's continue. Quote, the AD at Michigan isn't paid the same as the AD at Eastern Michigan. The AD at Michigan isn't paid the same as the administrative assistant at Michigan. They sure aren't denying themselves the fruits of the open market. It's Johnny Football who is deemed no different than a University of New Hampshire field hockey player. Now, some schools certainly do try to follow the rules. If out of self-interest, there is little doubt that programs caught up in Luther Davis bank records aren't too pleased. There's no indication anyone on campus knew it was happening. And Stillwater sure doesn't sound like a fun place this week. Still, the thinking here is so, inf 
infru infra infru tingly infru infer you know what i'm gonna skip over that word but see i'm an honest guy i don't feel bad about mispronouncing something live let's continue forward i want to come back to that i'm about to sound that out when i get off air <laughs> But actually, I want to pause really quick and, and discuss what he just said. That we try to compare at that time, Johnny Menzel at a Power Five university, the face of Texas A&M. At that point, probably the face of the SEC is compared or equivalent to a field hockey player in New Hampshire. Now, again, this is a difference between equal opportunity versus equal outcomes. Yes, of course they're equal from a humanistic standpoint, from a social standpoint. From an athletic standpoint, you know, they're both athletes and they have equal opportunity to participate in the things they want to do at the levels they want to do them at. But they do not have equal outcomes as far as their impact to their respective sports and the outcome in the money that their play generates for the school, for the team, for the sport in whole. So just as open market principles would say, as he talked about with the ADs being paying different, one in Michigan versus one in Eastern Michigan, all athletes do not create equal outcome. And so the market dictates based on that outcome, what people are willing to pay for your services, for your goods, for whatever you're selling. Now let's continue. before I butchered that word. Quote, one of the arguments against offering football players a cut of the revenue is that the school athletic departments can't afford it. Then the athletic departments in an effort to make sure it's following the rules or at least create the perception of doing so, construct massive compliance departments to monitor the athletes and stop them from getting any cash. Ohio State's compliance office, to pick just one example among many, has 15 employees. The top guys get six figures and a free car. Bloating up the budget with all these well-paying, administrative, non-coaching, non-training, non-athletic jobs, jobs that are completely unnecessary and serve no basic purpose in the world of either sports or education, just further drains the available funds and then conveniently backs up the argument that they don't have any money to share with the players. Around and around it goes. And this is a very good point. Non-coaching, non-training, non-athletic jobs. These are just people to enforce the rules by the NCAA. No rules. You don't need rule enforcers. So you therefore don't need compliance and all these, you need to grow your compliance staff for the benefit of the NCAA, the administrators, and also the compliance department who are well compensated for enforcing those rules. So there's an incentive. You get nice pay, nice benefits. You get a free company car, et cetera. Those are all incentives to do your job very well which would mean enforcing the rules, which uses up a piece of the pie that everyone's you know, talking about they want to slice or deserve a bigger slice. So we got to address the problem at its core. Here we go. Collectively, these athletic departments are spending tens of millions of dollars to make sure the athletes aren't getting an extra dime. The NCAA rule book is powerful. It isn't more powerful than the ever churning wheels of American capitalism. It stands no chance and never will. This is a country that favors open markets and the open market has clearly stated that top college players are more valuable than what their schools offer as compensation, which is also outdated. But this is just what the reality that the market 
is speaking to. They will do anything by any means necessary to try to connect with these players if they can under the books. Because again, if they were not that valuable and all the pushback and punishment was sufficient enough to say, man, we can't do this again, they would stop doing it. But they see opportunity. Let me continue. Maybe it is coaches giving something extra on National Signing Day or for making big plays. Maybe it's boosters expressing their delight at being entertained by giving an envelope of cash or, as the SI story comically uh, alleges, even paying a player to go fishing. Maybe it's agents and financial planners offering support today as a bet on future earnings. Or maybe it's memorabilia dealers lined up to give Johnny Menzel thousands of dollars to sign his own name on a picture of himself. Excuse me. That's the market speaking. These players are worth something. It's the NCAA that's trying to hold it back, clinging to the old deal. So the old deal is tuition, room and board. That was made about a century ago when the stadium seated 20,000, the games were on the radio and no one ever heard of tier one cable fees. So again, this exchange, this exchange of room, board and tuition which may have been very valuable at the beginning is no longer sufficient. So how is that fair? Because the system's broken, but let's continue. So in this case, let's go back to the title, playing hot potato with the grenade. Compliance, strength coaches, sports nutritionists, psychologists. Who blows up? Who catches the grenade and blows up? Who does it fall in the hands of? In this case, everything's pointing to compliance. Because you'd be able to be compensated for the impact you have for the team that produces the money. So in this case, it will become a very high demand to be with revenue producing sports. And we'll get to that as well. And that's gonna obviously be treacherous waters or light waters for a lot of people of the reality of who's producing money and who's not producing money. And it's just like the free market. If a business can't produce money, you cease to be a business. So there should be a different model, but let's continue. And I actually touch on that as well, because it's no different than what I'm talking about with the NCAA and other teams taken away from football and basketball's revenue, which is not fair because basketball and football have to give those against their will. And you can say it's not fair, but again, equal opportunity versus equal outcome. But let's continue. The real scandals don't involve money. They involve academics or drug test fixing or other real world issues. Systematic academic fraud, one that keeps borderline students uneducated is what should generate the harshest penalties, the loudest condemnations and the most aggressive NCAA investigations. These are after all supposed to be institutions of higher learning and the schools are very capable of looking into the stuff themselves. That isn't how the system is set up, though. College sports want to protect its money, making sure every dollar Menzel or Fluker or whoever can generate, uh, generate comes through them and only them. No side deals directly to the players. That's the motivation to stop middlemen. Doing so is financially beneficial to the schools in the short term while allowing them to pretend there is some level playing field that, again, allows them to call it amateur sports and allows them to avoid taxes and then allows them to howl out the scare tactic that the sanctity of competition would be lost if they did open if they did open things up financially to the athletes even if it is just embracing the olympic model of allowing outside income okay we actually at the bottom of, of the article it's it's all a bit con it all needs to change or these embarrassing revelations just continue on forever and ever the slow piling of straws on the camel's back that continue to ring out a simple truth the core problem isn't the breaking of the rules. It's the rules that are being broken. 
And this is the end of the first article in our review. One more article he wrote uh, as well. But really quick, I want to go to the systematic academic fraud that he mentioned. And this is my stance, something that I'm working on in my research is the separation of education and sports. Because for these top athletes to be able to get and accept to university, if they don't meet the academic requirements, they lower the standards. And you would not do that. You would not do that for other students. So how is that not the essence of discrimination? And in other cases, racism, especially if the athletes are predominantly African-American. And when I mean this discrimination, discrimination between athletes and non-athletes. So we have to consider that point and we have to consider that dynamic that the system's broken, the rules are ridiculous, and this whole symbolism of I'm playing sports as a means to drive me getting a quality education. It's just not possible. You can't put in 40 hours, 50 hours, 60 hours, travel, et cetera, while maintaining a full college load of classes, especially if you're gonna be in a discipline that's very challenging. Try to do that in biochemistry. Try to do that in physics or mathematics or what, whatever it is. So it needs to be separated because if it's separated, you can then have these athletes come in and they're only there for sports. They get their money, whether they become NFL players or not, because an interesting statistic, uh, statistic was, I believe it's something like 65, 60 to 65% of players, whether that's the NBA, uh, NFL, Major League Baseball, et cetera, especially the NFL, they believe they're going to the NFL when they enter college when in reality only 2% go. But if they're very good college players, they still have a market for themselves and they can make money for themselves while in college, even if they don't wanna focus on an education. And it's up to them if they wanna get involved and get classes and schedule those out of their own pockets that they're making from their names, likeness of their names and uh, the market that they create for themselves while in college. Whether they're making appearances or doing clinics or et cetera, because they're associated with uh, the program. So therefore they can make income from them, uh, for themselves over a four year period or five years if they, you know, they read not, well actually you wouldn't read shirt <laughs> over a four year period. So that's just something to consider. And I'm talking about, you know, the college level because these kids are adults now they're 18. So you wouldn't separate education and sport but I almost would say you separate at the lower levels because of the travel ball market. You don't need to have a high school basketball team that has limited spots anyway. AAU basketball provides that avenue. It could be local, it's obviously regional, it's obviously national. But we no longer need athletes to tie their education and sports together because of the travel ball market and the same in college. So they need to be separate. They go to school to learn and then in their time after school, they're focusing on sports, et cetera, but not, I'm only going, but, but not the conflict of interest as I'm only going to school so that I can play basketball. You separate the two. You go to school because you want to go to school and learn. That's, that's why you want to go to school, not as a means to be on the, the football team, the basketball team, the baseball team. 
And then we may, we, we may really see reality there, but let me continue. Let's move on to the next article. So strength coaches, you have to consider this. Support staff for Olympic sports, you have to consider this. It's already you know, like, you know, basketball and the revenue sports, they, they already understand this. But for everyone else, we have to start to come to the grips of the reality that we get rid of that system. Now, how do these athletes or these teams, these smaller teams survive? And when I mean survive, if cross country is such an important, let's say sport, or if the market finds it important, then do we not think that cross country runners all across the country who really enjoy wouldn't fund these programs? And when I mean fun, they wouldn't donate money to keep these programs running. Even if, let's say at the college uh, level, that they don't generate much revenue if they generate it at all. So we have this belief that's not backed up. We have this belief that, oh, if tennis doesn't get money from football, that tennis would cease to exist at the college level. How do you know that? How do you know the people of Tuscaloosa who enjoy tennis wouldn't donate their dollars for a tennis program at the university, pay for the facilities, et cetera? There's people who come and use, uh, and I'm talking about just regular people who come and use those facilities. They come and play tennis there all the time. You don't think they would donate their money to continue to play there and also to support the tennis team? Those are the same people that come to the matches. Same with golf, et cetera. So people want security. Okay, we know we're going to get money no matter what coming from this place. When the other person, in this case, the other team, may not have given it under their own discretion. And maybe they would have. But let's just say football would say, hey, you know, we're going to keep our money and you guys figure out how to stay afloat. Then why, didn't you, why don't we think those sports and their fan bases wouldn't support and donate to keep those afloat. And if not, then people just say, hey, you know, this is not important to us to keep it running. So we just have to, again, not try to change the world, but see the world as it is and try to figure out how best we can complement that. Now, second article. Same person, Don Wetzel, Don Wetzel, Dan Wetzel. It's entitled, NCAA still refusing to see big picture. All college sports are not equal. Equal in outcome, equal in outcome. This was published April 6, 2014. Get a quick drink of water. Let's begin. Oh, actually, let me see. This one's not too bad. Let me actually zoom in for you. All right. Quote, based on a steady, if slow, push of action and backed again by words during Sunday's annual state of the NCAA address at the Final Four, it's clear that the leaders of the college athletics are determined to make concessions toward their athletes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Additional monetary stipends, a voice for the players, scholarship adjustments, stricter practice times, limits are all on the table and some are inevitably going to be passed, at least at the biggest schools. There are all, excuse me, these are all small, common sense and almost impossible to oppose things that should have been done long ago, of course. The multi-pronged threat of union certifications, pending lawsuits, threatened lawsuits, public opinion, and so on has sped up the timetable. College sports appear to remain naive, however, to the depth of the opposition. Once the battle is engaged, a few minor steps will appease no one on the player's side. More, moreover, they aren't ready to acknowledge how the end game is likely not to, is not about college to, colleges deciding whether or not to allow student athletes to share in revenue, but uh, excuse me, trying to read too fast, but 
football players deciding whether they should continue to allow gymnasts, swimmers, wrestlers, and the like to share in their money. Let me repeat this. Moreover, they aren't ready to acknowledge how the end game is likely not about colleges deciding whether or not to allow student athletes to share in revenue, but football players deciding whether they should continue to allow gymnasts, swimmers, wrestlers, and the like to share in their money. So quickly, if there, if the decision was up to basketball and football, if they were going to share their money with the other teams, do you think they would keep it and say, no, you're on your own, gym, uh, gymnastics. No, you're on your own, swimmers. No, you're on your own, wrestlers. Do you think they would do that? Now, Let's not get it twisted. They have every right to say no, because everybody has a choice, yes or no. Do I wanna do this? Yes. Do I want to do this? No. So don't say it's an expectation or it's their obligation. You're blurring the lines. So they do have a right to say what it is they want to do with those funds. But ask yourself the question, what insecurity about ourselves tells us that they wouldn't do that? Especially with the relationships that these athletes tend to have, even though, hey, I'm a football player and you're a tennis player. And it may be different in some instances where they don't spend a, too much time together since football may have, they may do everything they do on site, they may have a calf, et cetera, but there's still going to be intermingling of these athletes. But what does create disdain, what does create confrontation, is when one team feels like someone's stealing from them because we have to give you this money no matter what, but let us choose whether we want to do that or not. And if we say no, then it should be understandable. Just like you go apply for a job and they say, no, we're good. We're going to go with another candidate. You don't get confrontational. That's just the decision. It's nothing personal. So we just have to keep that in perspective. If athletes said no, then that's their right. And if they said yes, which again, we can, it's just a hypothesis, then that's their right as well. And if not, then again, we find ways to create models for the other sports. But let's continue. College sports along, and quote, excuse me, college sports long ago created a system where cash brought in by essentially two sports, football and men's basketball, was pooled to fund up to two dozen other sports that, for the most part, generate little to no income or fan interest. And this hits hard, but we all know that this is what the reality is. So let's continue. The concept isn't without some merit. Who is against the hardworking track star getting a chance to compete and even perhaps earn a partial scholarship? Seems win-win until the football players realize who is and isn't paying for it. College sports are increasingly, increasingly, excuse me, capitalistic. These aren't just teams representing schools anymore. They are profit points that command their own cable television networks, massive stadiums, huge media rights, national tournaments, and billions and billions in revenue. While student athletes are rightly saying, why can't we get more of the pie? or at least the freedom to go out and get it themselves via sponsorship or advertising opportunities. The real debate is why are all student athletes being considered equal? NCAA president Mark Emmert repeatedly spoke Sunday 
of the 460,000 college athletes out there, but there is little commonality between a Division III cost country runner who is paying their own tuition and Johnny Menzel. And it's the next Johnny, or even the current Johnny, seeking royalties on Texas A&M memorabilia sales that will continue for years. That is the focus of the high price and unyielding lawyers and labor leaders. The NCAA says it can only afford to share a small portion of revenue with Manziel, say a $2,000 stipend, because it must give one to every athlete. And allowing athletes to cut into marketing money and donations that would otherwise go to the school will put the athletic department's coffers that fund, if I'm saying that right, coffers, coffers, that fund a full range of sports at risk. So let that sink in. That's crazy. And when I mean crazy, it's the justification is we cannot pay the players who the market says are valuable over the tuition board and room because we would have to play all players in this case. His reference was we would have to play Johnny Manziel and then we'd have to play also pay also that division three cost country runner. Now, I paused for a while because I said, let's go back to what I mentioned before. If cost crunchy runners across the nation wanted to fund and put their money, whether it's in their communities, regionally, statewide, whatever, if they wanted to put a pool of money together to make sure that these athletes could compete at the college level so that they could train and potentially live their dreams competing internationally at the Olympics. And a part of that money, this money pool from these cross country runners across the country could also pay these athletes. But of course not pay equivalent to what Johnny Manziel would get for Texas A&M. Because it's not possible. The money revenue is just not the same. We have $50, $50 million in revenue. You guys have $500,000. So therefore you get paid the same percentage, but the relative output is going to be different. 5% on 50 million, 5% on 500,000. It's equivalent percentage. It's just you're not talking about the same absolute value. But why couldn't that be possible? Why do we have lack of trust? And people, and you should really go back and look at the history of philanthropy, and you'd be very, very surprised how generous people are, even despite. And I'm talking about when government, government, total government spending was three percent of the GDP in the early 20th century, going back even to the 19th century, before government spending shot up to you know over 30 percent of the GDP, which started to creep up after the new deal with Franklin Delano Roosevelt and really got exacerbated in the sixties with Lyndon Johnson and, you know, moving forward. But we also have Jimmy Carter and we have also, but, but again, I'm not getting deep at that, but I'm saying is we have this insecurity that people are selfish, don't have any empathy and that the big fish live and the small fish get ate. So we have to keep that in mind. And how do we know, again, they would not pay for these students to be paid, whatever it is. I mean, it's, something's more than, 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 than nothing. And go forward. So just keep that in mind uh, as we go. Continuing. Why is that set policy, though, is why is that set policy, though, and why is downgrading the scope of some sports a bad thing? Why is it just assumed that elite revenue generating football and basketball players should automatically concede their market value to prop up smaller sports? Why are all players the same when no school pays the football coach and the field ho hockey coach the same amount? 
That's true. They're already showing the discrepancies of what the market wants based on the salaries. So if football wants to pay their head coach $40 million and tennis, you know, can only pay their coach $40,000. Why is that not fair? Because you would never say to pay, obviously, just to give the tennis coach a $40 million contract. No, no one would ever say that. But we talk about, oh, football salaries with these and, you know, these coaches are making this money. It's crazy, et cetera. But we don't use that same logic and that same argument across all sports and all coaches. So we can't vicariously live in other people's pockets because the market says that's what they're worth. That's what they're worth. But to use this sham, this symbolism of amateurism and good education, when that stuff is ludicrous, it's bogus, that's where the real issue lies. And you would have a, a much different take if you weren't trying to look at it through the lens of amateurism and education. And these athletes were just a part of the labor market and they were playing football as their job and not under the guise of education. Just continue. Most universities don't have the resources to move to that kind of model, Emmert said. So they'll probably be paying division three style. Stop. Exactly. That's where this is heading one day. Moving forward. College sports have expanded and so-called gold-plated non-revenue sports have grown to unprecedented and unnecessary levels. New facilities, expanded travel, conference expansion, and so on have come under the idea that the sports are equal, not, or excuse me, are equal even when they are not in a free marketplace. In a free marketplace, everybody can't be billionaires. There's not equal outcomes. So let me use an example that I heard from Walter E. Williams, economist. He said, me and Michael Jordan have the same equal opportunity to play basketball. But we do not have the same outcome. He becomes the best player in history. I'm lucky to hit the backboard. And I can spend a tremendous amount of time on basketball, and so does he. Yet he gets more return on that investment, and I don't. So I switch and go somewhere else and do something that's more in line with my skill set and my predispositions. So in this case, you are not going to get equal outcome across all sports. So we have to stop focusing on that because you're not going to make progress. You actually continue to hurt the system or you continue to hurt athletes and staff and et cetera. And we see these discrepancies with strength coaches or staff who work with football versus tennis. I've been there, I've done that. I've been a strength coach for six years and worked primarily with baseball, tennis, golf, et cetera. Just like if you were a soccer coach in Europe versus a baseball coach, who's probably going to get more pay? Where, where's more of a demand for it? So this is my point, but let's continue. So like I said, with strength coaches and the unionizing, et cetera, it still does not create and address what variables are actually creating the disparities between sports. So in this case, do strength coaches who work with football garner more wages than those who work with tennis? Because if tennis had to pay a minimum wage, let's say, to a strength coach for their program, for the money that they're generating for their programs, you you really, they really have to consider, man, we're just not going to have a strength coach. So therefore, you kill jobs, you kill jobs if that was a model you go to. Just look at the historical context. Let me continue to move forward. Quote. Non-revenue sports should operate under a less demanding, more regional manner that one, than one that comes under the umbrella of these geographically vast conferences that were constructed solely in pursuit of football television dollars. So basically what he's saying is, is that non-revenue sports are op operating above their means because they're able to tap into the resources forcibly from the revenue sports. So basically, tennis wouldn't be traveling to, let's say if you're in Washington 
in this case, you know, tennis wouldn't be traveling all the way to Florida for this elaborate tournament to play Michigan, excuse me, to play Michigan and Georgia Tech and North Carolina, et cetera. They'd be more regionally based. You know, they're paying, playing uh, Seattle U. You know, they may be playing Gonzaga. You see what I'm saying? So they would stay more regional. And that actually cuts down costs and it's more geographically efficient. But let's say a tennis program who's generating, you know, more money may be able to travel and go on a West Coast trip, an East Coast trip, and do all these things. But if not, that's just something you can't plan for. And it's also not right to say, well, we should be able to do what football does. Football travels all the way, et cetera. Why can't we do that? Because if you look at the numbers, you look at the data, you can't justify doing that. Hey, it's going to put you in the hole, coach, you know, $30,000. Yeah, but football does it. That's ridiculous. You never say that. You never go outside your house and say, hey, because my neighbor has a Bentley, damn it, I should have a Bentley. No, no like I said, logic has to be universal. You got to use the same logic in all cases. Let's continue. It's not a popular sentiment, but why would a field hockey team fly all over game? Uh, excuse me. Why would a field hockey team fly all over to games when there are plenty of schools within a bus drive? It may not be as grandos or grandiose, but it would be less demanding on the players who can't go pro in their sport. And importantly, it would be much more cost effective. It wouldn't even be the end of the world if there were no scholarships in these sports, if they were operated more like club teams. This is a very valuable point because these athletes are definitely more inclined to focus on their education because the chances of making it pro by that time, you're trying to get on the circuit, is little to none. But like I said, if they did want to get paid, it should be up to people who support that sport and industry if they choose to, to give their dollars to pay them and to fundraise for a trip to go play at this place, et cetera. Versus forcibly taking from another sport, creating confrontation, disdain, and all these disparities of justifying, hey, we should be able to do what basketball does. No, you shouldn't. Especially if you're looking at this as a business. They would never make those claims if they were looking as it, at it as a business. Anyway, continuing. Quote, or should a university want to use general funds to fully fund a soccer team? Then go ahead and do it. Some may have, some may have to do the Title IX. With declining state resources, and most public institutions have that, there is no impetus to take those dollars and shift them over and fund those types of teams, Kirk Schultz, president of Kansas State, said. For us, the best thing to do is have athletics fully supporting, and they cover those costs. It's definitely best for Kansas State. It is best for the Kansas State football players that generate the full funding, though. Excuse me, let me read that again. Is it the best for the Kansas State football players that generate that full funding, though? That's what the Ed O'Bannon lawsuit and the United Steelworkers and labor lawyer Jeffrey Kessler are going to demand. Non-revenue sports aren't a matter of concern for them. The trend lines are obvious. The trend lines here are obvious. The schools are going to have to share additional resources with the players who make the money. And that means tougher decisions about the players who don't generate the money. That's the end game here. It's straight capitalistic America. And so we have to stop with these boogeyman narratives of capitalism. Rich keeping the poor poor rich taking money from the poor, people are poor because the rich are the boogeymen. Again, read your history, look at your facts. Why was the industrial revolution possible? Why was the technological revolution possible? Why was the United States, who was a third world country in 1776, able to become a global economic power in less than 200 years? Let's move forward. Quote, I came up as a wrestler and I can tell you, I worked just as hard as any football player in the country and any basketball player. In fact, I would say I worked harder than those guys. Okay, well, you can say that, that's fine. Big 12 commissioner, Bob Bosley said, in fact, 
the fact is we have student athletes in all sports of sports that what <laughs> hold on let, let me read that let me run that back the fact is we have student athletes in all sorts of sports that if you apply any form of value to their labor you cannot pay football players and not pay gymnasts just because the football players has the blessing of an adorning public that is not that is nonsense that is absolutely nonsense Bosley continued that's the only difference there's a lot of student athletes that are worthy uh, that are worthy again we're not talking about them as athletes they don't have worth. of course they have worth as athletes but they're not generating the same outcomes so again that is uh i can't remember what, what it's called a fallacy but that is deferring and saying that well if we're going to pay you we got to pay everybody and if we're going to pay you this amount we got to pay everybody that amount that's nonsense but good good one good one see symbolism there it, it, it's symbolic and it makes people feel good oh yeah well you know he's considering that hey the gymnasts are just as important as the football players okay so if gymnasts if this athletic department was to survive on the money from gym gymnastics everybody be out of a roster spot this is my point this is how you create the disparity and how it's not generating equal outcomes so strength coaches you have to consider this sport nutritionists, you have to consider this what does my trajectory look like if this does shift to a free market because if I'm coaching tennis, I'm not as valuable from a dollar standpoint from the market. What can the market actually pay you? Not what you think and not what you think your value is. It's what the market is willing to pay you. Then this is going to, this changes the game. So strength coaches have been of benefit of this system because these teams are kept around. So therefore you have an opportunity to have a job you know, but normally you start off with, and normally these teams get the strength coaches who tend to be, you know, first years, et cetera. So you're not going to have, you know, a seasoned guy working with twins as his first job, like he would, you know, if he was working his first job. These are teams normally GAs get. This was the plot when I was at Purdue. You know, we don't get treated fairly. We don't think, you know, you guys give us a strength coach who just only focuses with us. Like they wanted a full time strength coach. And that's what I gave them when I was there. They wanted a full-time strength coach, not someone who's with football and just, you know, coming and hanging out with us one hour during the week, et cetera. They wanted somebody to practice, who traveled, the whole nine yards. And I gave that to them. I did that for them. Happy to do it. Let's continue. That's all well and good, but hard work guarantees nothing in the United States. And it's often not rewarded. I mean, I mean, now if that doesn't sum up this whole discussion is that you can work hard doesn't mean you're going to make a sale you can have the world's best business model and not sell a you know a product make a dime and you've been working your butt off so work hard work is no guarantee of an outcome as i use my michael jordan and Monty williams situation with basketball they both spend 40 hours a week playing basketball michael jordan becomes the best player in the world he becomes an economist <laughs> an economist <laughs> continue besides there are tons of worthy students athletes and non-athletes out there it doesn't mean players who have an adorning public are obligated to prop them up that, i mean i guess so ridiculous if a university had to use general funds on declining on deciding which student is worthy of a free ride a softball player or a biology major everyone seems to agree that decisions will go to academics well, isn't that the point of school anyway? We can wax poetic uh, about non-revenue sport athletes, but if we're talking money and it always comes down to money, what's their value? I am very opposed to changing that, Schultz of KSU said. There is no support for that. We want to do, what we want to do is enhance the financial package for all student athletes, whether it's women golf, field hockey, men's basketball, football. At some point, they won't be able to meet all the demands though. The saber rattling that Emirate and the others did Sunday was to criticize the NBA and NFL for not having minor leagues in place to take the high earning student athletes out of the college game by letting them turn pro out of high school. Actually, let me, let me read that again. 
was to criticize the NBA and NFL for not having minor leagues in place to take the high earning student athletes out of the college game by letting them turn pro out of high school. We hope that the NBA and the NBA Players Association will make some changes, Wake Forest President Nathan Hatch said. And this is an interesting aspect because if the NFL and the NBA had minor leagues where these players could decide, hey, do I want to go to college or do I want to just get in the, the professional pipeline? I'm, a, I'm actually already a professional player. Because going back to my second podcast, number two, that, I mean, from what they found in Oklahoma study, Oklahoma State study, you know, athletes aren't getting too much faster. They're getting bigger and stronger, but they're not getting too much faster. So you have to ask yourself, do I turn pro when my potential is at its highest when I'm 18 years old, 17 years old, or do I go to college and bank on getting development there? But I'm not going to increase the speed enough to potentially get a return on investment from it going pro and getting into the system out of high school. So you have to ask yourself, if they set that up, that would kill college sports because the best players would now turn pro. They start getting get that money. So, you know, you better watch out, you know, be careful what you ask for. But that definitely would cure it up. But therefore, it's revenue would um, decline if the stars are no longer in college and required to stay for three years in football. This is that whole notion on education. You know, NBA players, you know, if they're good enough, they're leaving as freshmen. So they're not fin finishing college right away anyway. Same thing with, you know, uh, football players. You know, hey, I'm getting drafted as a junior. I'm out here. They may finish or they may not finish. I don't know. But again, we can't use that and hang that over their head. But again, if they did have a minor league pipeline, then you probably lose a lot of these players. As we're starting to see already with LaMelo and various others who will go and play professionally and then come back over here internationally. There's a, there's a demand for such a system. This is absurd, as I continue. This is absurd and cast misplaced blame. It's not the Kentucky freshmen that are the problem. It's not Menzel. Those guys should be embraced. They are funding this entire enterprise while experiencing campus life, and it sure seems having fun doing it. It's completely backwards to push those guys away, except the powers that be, the powers that see what? <laughs> Hold on, let me run that back. I gotta run that back. It's completely backwards to push those guys away, except the powers that be see them as a threat to the purse strings, I see. The truth is, oh, actually, we're at the bottom. Yeah, yeah, we're at the bottom. All right. The truth is, last three sentences, the truth is the NCAA isn't going to run from the people that are making them wealthy. The issue is demanding they prop up everyone else. Not all sports are equal. That's just reality. I just don't think there is any possibility of this going forward without all student athletes being considered, uh, Bowlesby said. Again, you can use that argument, but it, one, impedes it from moving forward, and two, it's just not a logical um, analysis. Last sentence. Well, at some point, that's where it's headed. When the revenue inevitably gets shared, this becomes an internal campus debate and the smart money is on the guys with the adoring publics. And I don't know why, why he keeps saying with the adoring publics. Fans like what they like. And as I said, are there cost country fans? Of course. But do they trump or do they equate to the, the amount of fan fare for football? No, there's 2 million cross country fans nationwide. You know, there's 50 million in football. It's like, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. But in ending this podcast, and I really appreciate you tuning in, who blows up in this game of hot potato with the grenade? Of course, the compliance office should cease to exist, and they will cease to exist when NCAA moves to a free market system as I'm creating in my PhD studies. And I feel, again, I, I'm not saying compliance or them, they're not worthy, et cetera, but 
it's a system that's flawed and your whole job has been created on a system that is dependent on it on its existence for you to have a job and you get paid very well because why wouldn't you there has to be every incentive to really do their job and enforce those rules yet when punishment does happen i mean they're they're very minuscule when we have other issues like and i can't remember the name of the place but i'll probably do a couple of articles on them where we don't have any universal enforcement of health and safety standards in college so the athletes take all the risk reap none of the rewards yet you want to have lackadaisical health and safety enforcement concussion protocols non-efficacious practice we talk about that stuff but it's not enforced because if it was <laughs> i got plenty of stories as a strength coach with some nonsense that happened on the field that was like come on i mean people should be getting in trouble that's a story for another day. So just a couple of takeaways, you know, support staff, sports performance professionals is what I, you know, I'll call this group. In a free market, our value changes. Right now, the system does benefit staff because now tennis can have a nutritionist. But most of us have multiple teams where football, they have strength coaches on staff just for football. And that already tells you the difference in worth and value. I mean, value, monetarily speaking, marketly speaking. Because if we're both making $40,000, let's just say hypothetically, we're both making $40,000, the guy working with football and the strength coach working with tennis, yet the strength coach with tennis also has golf also has women's tennis. So that's three teams right there. They may be working with another club. Let's say baseball, or let's say lacrosse, whatever. So this person has four or five teams for $40,000. While the strength coach with football is a part of a group. It's five total strength coaches and they're all just for football. So you got one team, one responsibility, you know what you're getting into you know, every single day. That already tells you there, the amount of work for both is not even equal in the sense of how many athletes you have to manage. Not numbers, I'm talking about different teams. So that shows you the discrepancy and the disparities there, especially when teams are fighting for, we want more individual time. We want our strength coach to travel. Some do, but I wouldn't, like for instances, like with tennis, I mean, I wouldn't travel because they said, hey, I mean, like we didn't factor that into the budget. It actually costs more money for you to travel. Like, nah, you can't, <laughs> you can't, you can't do that, Tim. Uh, especially with my experience at Purdue was, you know, I traveled with, with uh, the tennis team. So like I said, you know, these things come up all the time. And we just have to consider that. How would our roles change in a free market system? And why don't we think that people who enjoy wrestling, cross country, et cetera, wouldn't fund these programs for these athletes to have these opportunities to compete. And we'll deal with, and I'll deal with the education side because you say, well, hey, how are these athletes still gonna pay for school? Well, I'll talk about that in a podcast I'll do after I do my MLB, MILB to 2021, that the increasing but the problem with the increasing tuition rates is twofold. The raising of the college age or the college wage premium. So that's the difference between what college graduates make and high school graduates make. And then also the exponential increase in the student loan funding program, I believe that's what it's called. So basically just government spending on student loans has created an incentive for the universities to continue to raise their prices because they're guaranteed that students will be able to meet those increasing prices because they can get loans. And that'll solve that problem with a free market approach to education that would lower the prices because now it would be a competitive advantage to have lower prices as I kind of 
uh, will allude to that in for-profit universities who generate 90% of their profit or over 90% of their profit from tuition are much cheaper than non-profit public and non-profit private schools who for non-private, who for public non-profit universities, tuition makes up about 21% of their revenue and for private non-profit universities, it's like 33%. Yet for schools who generate not over 90% of profit through tuition, they have the lowest tuition rates. So that's an interesting model. It's a, well, not a model, but it's actually interesting that you're actually trying to make money, yet you're cheaper. So we just have to consider that and I really appreciate you tuning in. I can't wait for the fourth podcast. If you need to sign up, go to athleticholisticsystems.com. That's holistic with an H and that's athleticholisticsystems.com. I really appreciate you tuning in. I'll see you on the next podcast.